So in this video, I'm going to show you how to work out the equations of motion for uh, a system consisting of a massive pendulum swinging from a massive harmonic oscillator where the spring and the rod there are taken to be massless. There will be two equations of motion in this problem because there are two coordinates characterizing the motion of the system, namely the angle of the pendulum oscillation there, phi, and then the spring extension, x. So uh, the first thing I did in setting up the Lagrangian was I worked out the x and y displacements for the pendulum, and then I used that to write down the kinetic energy for the massive pendulum. So, of course, looking at this system here, we have two contributions to the x displacement. One is the spring extension. Oh, and by the way, I used capital X and Y for the coordinates because I'm using x for uh, the spring extension. But anyway, that contributes to the value of the x displacement of the pendulum. And then also there's a contribution from the oscillation, which using intuitive trigonometry, which I've written there, is uh, just L sine of phi. That's the contribution to the x displacement of the pendulum from those oscillations. Then, because the harmonic oscillator isn't oscillating up and down in the y direction, the only contribution to the y displacement is the pendulum swinging. And we take the zero of the y-axis to be right there at the bottom of the um, massive oscillator, the cart there, where the pendulum rod attaches. So then the y displacement is just minus L cosine of phi. So then, of course, the kinetic energy is defined entirely in terms of the time derivatives of the x and y coordinates. So using the chain rule to differentiate, time differentiate those values for the displacements gives us this result here. So now we know the kinetic energy is just uh, a half m, the velocity dotted with the velocity. So writing that out gives us a simple sum of squares of the x and y component. Nothing surprising there. And if we expand out those squares, we get something that can be simplified with that Pythagorean trig identity right there. And that yields our final result for the kinetic energy of the pendulum. So now we need to work out the kinetic energy of the uh, harmonic oscillator. Now that's super easy because it's just moving back and forth and the uh, amount it moves back and forth is just given by the spring extension. So then immediately the x and y displacement is just the spring extension plus a constant because maybe it's uh, not at the x origin and also there's no saying that it, the mass is right at the y equals zero in fact if we look up here y equals zero is at the bottom of the cart whereas the center of mass would probably be something above it but the important thing here is just that um, the only difference from it being zero is at most a constant value and the only difference f uh, from the x displacement just being equal to straight up the string extension is going to be an added on constant which all goes to zero those constants go to zero under the time derivative and the kinetic energy is just dependent on the time derivative of these coordinates so then the kinetic energy simply is a half m x dot squared where x dots the string or the time derivative of the string extension so then of course the total kinetic energy the quantity we're ultimately interested in is just the sum of the two so summing them and then simplifying a little bit gives us the final result for the kinetic energy that we needed. Now the potential energy is really easy to write because while there are two sources of potential energy, they each completely separately affect uh, the two moving parts of the system. 
The only potential experienced by the oscillating cart is the harmonic oscillator potential there. And the only potential experienced by the mass is the gravitational potential, intuitively given the way the system is configured. So, of course, that's just mgym. And if we plug in ym, that's just minus l cosine theta, or sorry, cosine phi. I'm used to using theta for the angle, but I used phi this time. So then the gravitational potential here, um, is just equal to minus mgl cosine phi. So of course the total potential is just the sum of the two, so here we finally get the potential we're interested in. Now the Lagrangian famously is just t minus u. Now usually I have a non-script capital L for the Lagrangian, and I save the script L for Lagrangian densities in field theory, but this time uh, the diagram that I found on Google for this system, because I didn't want us to create my own, uh, uses capital L for the pendulum length. So I couldn't use that for the Lagrangian, so I used script L, even though it's not a Lagrangian density. It's just a straight up mechanics Lagrangian. Right, so that's why the script L is the way it is for the Lagrangian, because I'm using L for the pendulum length. So in order to get the equations of motion, I need to differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to the string extension, one of the two parameters or generalized coordinates of our problem, and then differentiate uh, the Lagrangian with respect to the time rate of change of that, and then apply a time derivative to that. Of course, the boxed result is right there through the calculation written up above it. I try and write out lots of steps so it's totally clear what's going on. Uh, and also so that I can more easily error check things before I record. Having all the steps written out makes that easier. So anyway, then the simplification is a bit longer here, but the process is intuitive. You take the uh, x dot derivative and then the time derivative. So this is what the x dot derivative looks like in the um, curly brackets there, and then applying the time derivative to that gives us this result, which is then boxed conveniently there. So then the Euler-Lagrange equations, of course, just sets the difference of the two equal to zero, which is equivalent to setting them equal to each other, and uh, simplifying that as much as possible, which really isn't much at all, gives this final result. So uh, this is one of the main goals of this video. The point was to show you how to derive the equations of motion for this system, which would be quite difficult to analyze with Newton's laws. It would be kind of confusing. Of course, they're equivalent, so it would be possible, but it would probably be pretty confusing to analyze a system that complicated with Newton's laws directly. So uh, the goal is to show you how to derive the equations of motion for the system using Lagrangian mechanics. So, you know, I always bold and box the sort of main results and just box the intermediate results. So one of the main results here is to show you the Lagrangian, since we're using Lagrangian mechanics for this problem. And then, of course, the whole goal is to get to the equations of motion, so those are also bolded and boxed as main results. So continuing on, now we need the swing angle equation of motion. We've got the spring extension equation of motion, as I called it, spring extension equation of motion. We've got that right there all finished. So now we need the swing angle equation of motion. And the process is the same. We differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to that generalized coordinate, and we get a nice, not too complicated result. And then we differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to the time variation of the generalized coordinate, this oscillation angle, and then apply a time derivative to that and get this result here. Then, of course, uh, we simply apply the Euler-Lagrange equations for that generalized coordinate right here. So, uh, let me get that little box off the screen that happened. Okay, so setting the two equal to each other, or their difference equal to zero of these two derivative objects of the Lagrangian gives us this directly, and then some things cancel out. And the cancellation is really quite nice. It ultimately boils down to this here, which is not a terribly complicated equation of motion. Of course, this is still a coupled system, 
and a very non-linear system, but uh, the equations of motion at least aren't too nasty. You can always construct systems with much nastier equations of motion than this system of coupled ones. Uh, and we can actually simplify it further for the case of small angles. This doesn't decouple the system or stop it from being nonlinear, but it certainly decreases the nastiness of the nonlinearity. So uh, <clears throat> here we take the small angle approximation. In that case, sine phi, of course, just acts like a linear function of the angle, and cosine phi is roughly equal to 1. Inserting that, and we get this here pair of results for the uh, small angle equations of motion. So a little bit uh, better, but not perfect. So that is how you use, or I mean perfect, uh, in the sense that it's the correct answer, but not ideal, and that it's still a somewhat complicated answer. But regardless, that is how you use Lagrangian mechanics to do the otherwise rather non-trivial task of deriving the equations of motion here and, wait, that's the Lagrangian. Here <laughs> and here for a system consisting of a pendulum attached to the mass of a massive harmonic oscillator. Dietrich out.